All right. Well, I am absolutely delighted to introduce our next panel. All of these legislators know groundwater. They understand the importance of the resource and are really committed to securing Texas's water future. Sitting to my right is Representative Kyle Cassell from Brazos County, representing House District 12. He was first elected to the House back in 2012. Over the years, he's been on a number of committees. Uh, he currently serves on both the House Natural Resources Committee as well as Environmental Regulation, and I think you've had a few other stints on House Natural Resources in the past as well. Uh, next, we have Senator Charles Lubbock from uh, representing Senate District 28. That is the largest Senate district in Texas. I think it even got a little bit larger this last go round. No? Oh, it got smaller. <laughs> Where's he served uh, since 2014? Prior to that, he was in the House of Representatives from 2010 until his election to the Senate. He currently chairs the Senate Committee on Water, Agriculture, and Rural Affairs and serves on a long list of other committees. I'm not going to go through them all here. Um, but of particular note, I will mention he is currently on the Sunset Commission. Next, we have Representative Tracy King of Uvalde, representing House District 80. He is a longtime public servant, has served in the House since 1995. Over his tenure, he served and chaired a number of committees and is the current chair of the House Natural Resources Committee. And finally, Sarah, Senator Sarah Eckhart of Austin, representing Senate District 14. That includes both Travis and Bastrop counties. Uh, Senator Eckhart was elected to the Senate in 2020. Prior to that, she served as both a Travis County Commissioner and most recently the Travis County Judge. She's a member of the Senate Water, Ag, and Rural Affairs Committee. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, so today we're going to spend a little bit of time just catching up on what's been going on in terms of groundwater over the interim, talk some key priorities, and then shift the conversation to the upcoming 88th legislative session and dive into some specific topics there. Chairman King, I was going to start with you. Um, as the chair of the House Natural Resources Committee, uh, all the audience heard a little while ago about the groundwater interim charge that uh, you guys are looking at this interim, as well as the hearing that occurred last week. I was hoping you could perhaps tell us about some of the issues that are raised in that charge and how that hearing played out. It should be on. They'll just raise the level. One, two. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the question, and I appreciate the patience of those that sat through that hearing. And, um, and of course, everybody watched it virtually. They all told me that at the cocktail party last night. They saw every minute of it virtually. And um, but it, um, we, looked at, uh, we looked at something that's near and dear to me because of the district I represent, and that's groundwater and uh, export projects that are going around. I thought it was time that we, it wasn't too soon to take a candid look at what the effect of um, those export projects are, the ones that, that have been in effect for a little while and that we have good data on. Um, we talked a lot about, um, about the plugging of abandoned uh, water wells and oil and gas wells and wells that were in the gray area that were originally oil and gas wells but then were plugged back to make an oil uh, a water well and whenever those become deteriorating you know what um, what we can do I, um, I mentioned that um, that I did carry a piece of legislation a number of years ago it was one of y'all's this group's recommendations to give the groundwater districts another tool to deal with deteriorated wells, which um, we passed out of the House, the Senate passed it out, and then the, our friend across the street had a better idea about it. And so we're going to get to try that one again and see what we need to do to make it work. But um, and um, let me see. what We talked about a lot of different things, but we had about six hours of testimony on the first day and about eight hours the second day. And I, I really appreciate the committee members that came. We had a, a pretty large group of them there. Thank you. And Representative Cassell, what were your takeaways from that hearing? It was a, am I live? Well, good morning. Thank you for having me. First, the, it was a great hearing. It was long and lengthy, and I don't know if all those folks were listening on the virtual web, but, you know, what I, I saw immediately was that those of you that came to us to testify on the charges enlightened the panel. The problem was that Tracy and Four Price and myself were the only long-standing natural resource committee members. And are we going to be on that committee next year? Where do we go? You've had a great 
set of panels this morning. I've been with you since about 8.15, and we've recapped that interim hearing and the charges and where we went and the issues, and you understand them. Tracy and I understand them, but there's 148 members of the legislature that Mr. Sledge pointed out that we'll, we'll know who those are, individuals are on November 9th, and so together we're going to have to educate them because they're not all water savvy, nor is water savviness a hot political button. We're in a drought. we got an incredible amount of growth. Where are we going to go next? A lot of good ideas, but that's a lot of members of the Texas House to educate on water. As I look out there, just so you know, I look at it, Vanessa, and water aquifers are infrastructure. This session <laughs> will be focused on infrastructure. It's like real estate, location, location, location. This is going to be infrastructure, 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 and water is the key to that. And in front of her is my good friend Wayne Wilson, who got me involved in water issues as a Farm Bureau president in Brazos County when we formed the Brazos Robertson Groundwater District, and Robbie Cook with his incredible sage advice. You know, I've been kind of put into the fire on this and thankfully ended up in the legislature and had three speakers give me the confidence to be on natural resources to serve and work with you. So we've got a lot of work to do and I'll stop there and, you know. Well, and I'll say, you know, that was a very long hearing. And um, in addition to having the, the experience, you, Representative Price, Chairman King, were there listening actively for the whole thing. And that's a lot of listening. <laughs> so we do appreciate that. Um, so Senator Perry, I was going to turn to you now. Um, your committee also has a groundwater charge and understand that there's going to be hearing a hearing on that coming up in the next few weeks, maybe a month from now. Um, what do you see the focus of that hearing being and kind of what issues do you want to bring to the forefront? Yeah. So again, thank you for having me here. It's always Good to be here. I, I guess what I'm listening is maybe the Senate side doesn't have long enough hearings, Senator Eckhart. Maybe we need to do that. I, I try to try not to drag them out. Uh, water has three components to it that make it almost politically impossible to do. One, it's expensive. Two, it's long term. And three, it's not real sexy. And as the water taps turn around, nobody believes there's a water issue. So that is our challenge. And I got great advocates in this group right here that kind of get it and understand the need for it. And there's not a sense of urgency talking about water supply and that's where I'll stay. That's where I've been and that's where I'll go. Uh, specifically to infrastructure, both energy and water. That'll be a focus for me personally, as well as the hearings that we have. On the groundwater stuff that's come up since last uh, session, if you will, and over the interim process, Vista Ridge, I think is on everybody's mind. <clears throat> for those that don't understand where I come from on that, I've always been about the science of the data. Now we've got as Chairman King said, we've got some uh, data now on exporting of water that we thought the science would, def would support that region's ability to do that, and we're finding out that maybe, just maybe, that was a little bit off and we got people with wells drying up. So conversation about mitigation funds and how do we work that into a scenario where the, in the event that those cases will happen and the more Texas grows, those are gonna be more commonplace than we'd like to admit. We need to work on how do you how do you handle the downside of that for those owners left behind? Uh, the cost of water, it, and we've said it a hundred times in here, and you people understand it better than anything, it's always been too cheap. And if we're going to actually allow you to move water out of a, per, out of a region, which personally I can tell you when you export water, you, expect the future, you export the future of that community normally. But if you are going to do it and the law allows it, and I'm supportive of private property rights that get you there, then we need to have the cost of water on the front end to have a separate kind of funding vehicle for those that don't have the option to move when those events occur. So that will be one. And then infrastructure from Winterstrom, Uri, uh, estimated 143 billion gallons of water a year goes into the ground from leaky pipes. We're working on some, what does an infrastructure fund to maybe leverage with our 8,000 water supply systems around the state that could hopefully start replacing 60% of our, almost 60% of our pipes in the ground are at or above useful life by a long shot. So that's a water supply opportunity from existing supplies that if we get that right. So I don't know what that looks like today. The, the number started out at 64 billion. I heard a 90, $190 billion number the other day. Texas isn't gonna write that check just so that anybody in here serves on city or local governments too. We're not writing those checks, but maybe we can come over the partnership through existing funds at Water Development Board or other programs like that can help 
at least start having the conversation about replacing leaky pipes. Thank you. And Senator Eckhart, uh, kind of picking up on that and the reference to Vista Ridge and moving water, there was already one uh, Senate Water Ag and Rural Affairs interim hearing where groundwater wasn't specifically on the agenda, but there ended up being a discussion about it. Um, wondered if you wanted to maybe comment on that and that issue. Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I represent Travis and Bastrop counties, and so I'm in the crosshairs of the effects of Vista Ridge. Um, my community, uh, Bastrop County, as well as the communities to the north of me in Milam, Lee County, uh, et cetera, are seeing uh, depletions of their, their water. Um, because of the Vista Ridge project. So we are right in the thick of the idea of uh, interbasin transfers and how we're gonna manage that. Um, my interests uh, as a county judge and now as a senator uh, remain figuring out how we can, I, I'm a Texan, lifelong Texan. My parents are lifelong Texans and their parents, their parents, and their parents. So I get it. Whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. But we do need to find a Texas method for regulating this resource. Um, up till now, we have a, uh, a legal mythology with groundwater that it is a private right. That's because it's a necessary resource for all of our survival. So how do we... Uh, get to a comprehensive regulation of the quality, the amount, and the distribution of water in Texas, including groundwater. And so that's what I'm focused on and will be focused on through these hearings. It is a state obligation. The private sector cannot solve this for us. Uh, it's a huge part of the solution, um, but the private sector does not have the responsibility or the interest for solving it. Only the state can, um, with, of course, uh, local input. Representative Cassell, do you care to comment on the water transfer issue? I think that, you know, you're, you're, you don't represent the area where Vista Ridge is now, but you're right next door. Um, and I, those kind of pressures are probably going to be coming your way as well. Absolutely. It has an incredible impact on, you know, our Brazos Robertson groundwater district and you know I'm glad I've got a lot of friends and we're, we're watching it in the science that we talked about in the interim hearings we have to focus on this this session we have a lot of uh, I'll say if you look at this panel I mean there's some nuclear political options out there that are gonna you know put us at odds when we start but we've got to put those aside and focus on water and this Vista Ridge project look at the impacts it's having on the Creso Wilcox look what it's doing to the Simbro I mean these are areas of water that affect not only Senator Eckhart's area but you know as I my new district now mirrors the entire project from Burleson County all the way to San Antonio, it's going to have a huge impact, but we've got to do a better job. We've got options out there. We've got to be more creative. You've got so many experts out here, and I'm going to keep going back to utilizing your knowledge to help educate our colleagues, because I can't say it enough, they are not hyper-focused on water and the future of Texas. Senator Perry said it best, it rained the last two weeks. Everybody in the state of Texas thinks the drought is over. Problem is we're gonna have another one and we're gonna have another two, 20 million people living here. This session we have funding coming in, we have opportunities with the federal government and we're gonna have to capitalize on that now because we all know this, it's cheaper to build the infrastructure now than it will be in another 20 years. I think right at the end of that last panel, there's a, a lady that was focused on that and you said you were gonna take, take that up in a future panel, but she was correct. It's time to act and that's going to be our job and we're gonna need your help to help convince our colleagues that water and water infrastructure aquifers are infrastructure. <laughs> I think Vanessa's hit the nail on the head, but we've gotta do a better job working together and getting to that point. You. Representative King, would you care to comment on the transfer issue? Well, um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I agree with everyone here that it, it absolutely is something that, that you have to take an honest appraisal of. 
And um, you know, of course, representing the area that I do, it's um, a groundwater area and a river area. We don't have any, well, we have uh, Falcon Lake, you know, so we've got um, some reservoirs. But I mean, we've always been real protective of our groundwater. And so, I mean, that's, that's gonna be my slant on it. But I'm not, I'm not unrealistic. I also know where the water is for the future of Texas. And, um, and eventually, you know, we'll, we'll all have to look at something else. I mean, you know, I always tell people that conservation and desal, which is another topic that we covered, uh, desal are the long-term future. And people ask me why. I said, well, I mean, it, you know, I mean, it might be 100 years from now, it might be 50 years from now, but obviously most of our water is going to come from conservation efforts and, and, and desal in the long, long term. Eventually, you can't rely on groundwater forever. And the surface water is, is limited, and our ability to create more is limited. The good news about surface water is it always does rain eventually. It does. And, you know, someday, I don't know um, whether um, Chairman Perry and I will be here when they do it. And, um, but I, I would assume that someday in the state of Texas, people take a, a different view on interbasin transfers than what we currently have right now. Um, and the whole uh, basin of origin issue, you know, that, that's pretty much been set in stone here in Texas since sometime in the 90s. And, and I supported the current, the current law when it was passed. But, you know, I, I, I'm not, I think that there's nothing wrong with taking, again, an honest examination of whether that's actually good public policy or not. I don't know. But anyway, that's one transfer issue that I think will come up at some point in the future. Thank you for that. So, uh, Representative Cassell, you mentioned, and, and Senator Perry as well, the drought. And uh, I would want to talk about that a little bit more here. We had an incredibly, incredibly dry summer. And yes, now it's been raining for two weeks. Um, the drought monitor, though, I mean, we still have 43% of the state, even after these improvements, in abnormal or extreme drought. Um, and in addition to the water is for, you know, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting quote, the other one we often think about is never let a good crisis go to waste, right? And so did we already miss our window <laughs> with these rains? I hope not. Um, and I would like to talk about drought and its impact on the upcoming session. Uh, Representative Cassell, why don't we start with you? How do you see it specifically impacting the upcoming session? You know, I hope our colleagues remember it. To, to your point, they forget about it. Uh, but we do know we have another drought coming. We've got to do a better job of preparing. So when Chairman King talks about uh, conservation, uh, ASR projects, we talked about this, this flooding event that we're having. How are we not mitigating or utilizing this flood water? Is, uh, I think about my good friends Trent Ashby, and uh, I've already missed my good friend Lyle Larson, when they fight over the Commonwealth of East Texas and all the water over on that side of 59. How do we utilize this water? You know, we don't want to give it up. We have private property rights. But when we have these flood events or have these huge rains or a tropical storm, you know, I think of our Navasota River Basin between Lake Limestone and the city of Navasota, roughly about 80 miles of flat terrain that will hold water for months. How do we put that water in the transfer portal. How do we utilize that? I mean, we're going to have to be creative. There's a lot of ideas. You out there are a lot smarter than I. We've tried all kinds of legislation working together, but we got to make sure and ensure that Texas succeeds. And the only way to do that is to make sure we have water when the next drought does come. And our colleagues are going to have to get on the water education train quick. Absolutely. Senator Perry, what should we be doing? What should we be looking at um, to, take to take advantage of, but, you know, to, at this moment, so that we're better prepared for future droughts? So the only real benefit of having a drought is a reminder that we don't have a real sustainable water plan in Texas that works in practice. So uh, you just don't want to let that opportunity pass. The last significant water legislation we did outside of the Harvey flood relief packages was the SWIFT. And it came in on the heels of a major drought. Uh, so we have an opportunity now. I think we have enough industry segments running into this state every day that are demanding to know that we have both electrical and water supply. And if we're honest, the water supply conversation uh, may not be being fully answered by the data behind it. So um, they're going to start asking those hard questions, too, I think, as continues to grow. So 
we just need to seize the day on the on the on the conversation that gets politicians excited, and that's jobs and creation and, and, and opportunities. I don't know that we've connected those dots well. So I've called out the water plan very clearly. Senate Bill 1511 said, in our water plan, there are things in there that everybody says check the box and we're good on that in practice may not come to fruition. I don't do that to be a mean guy. I do that because, one, I don't want to ever mislead people. Two, I think Texas has to be honest about opportunities for future water supply. And if we're planning on it and relying on it, other people are too, it has to be in practice. It has to happen. It has to be a reality check. So, so I'll continue those kind of calling BS, if you will, on a little bit of the stuff. It's good that we have a plan, but it's got to be a real plan to get in this area. As far as the drought goes, agriculture, you know, the good news is your fillets should go down. They're, they're auctioning off cattle and, and wholesaling cattle out right and left up in my area because they can't feed them out because it's the drought. Um, cotton in my area is king. I think 70% of the crop is not going to make this year. That's down from like 7 million acres, I think, in the previous year that did. We had all the perfect storm for good cotton crop. But So it really has an economic impact. About $20 billion is kind of the economic impact of our ag sector right now where that ends up, but it's not looking good from an ag perspective. Um, to modern water sources, Senate Bill 601 is something we also are going to have a monitoring charge coming up in October. We'll get back to where we left last session. Uh, that report is due today. Hopefully, you'll be able to go out tomorrow and get the produced water Senate Bill 601 study. I am encouraged with what I'm hearing about it. It literally has an option to provide more acre feet than we need in my West Texas region of the state if we go down that road and get a pilot project to proof of concept and put it up. So next session, I'll be asking for funding to prove out that concept of Senate Bill 601 for produced water uh, pilot study. But what's frustrating to me about water and, and, and it's we have the solutions today that do not require industry a, a, a effectively closing out of an industry to meet our future water needs but it always stops with it costs too much at some point what is too much when you run out so so I'll be that guy that keeps saying we got to do it no matter what the cost is to in order to secure future for future so I'm always going to be that guy that what is too much when you run out? And I think that's a reality that a lot of our folks. And then I read an article today coming over. They've done studies about 300 gallons for a house a, fam a day for a family of four can realistically get by. And that statistically there's some households using 17,000 gallons a day. It goes to something Chairman King said. We have to have a fundamental concept and philosophical discussion about why we don't need to use what we're using today and how we can get by with less. Because I tell you, we're, we're not set up for the future. And back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, and farmers, I see Ronnie Hopper over there from my area, they had a different conservation philosophy. Once row watering was kind of, that's not a good idea, let's do something different. From that point forward in history on our stewardship bag, they got to a conservation-minded place. We've got to start teaching our kids and our, and our folks that water is not something that's automatic and it's a guarantee. It's actually limited resource. And we've got to do a better job of educating people. You can't just turn on a three-acre three plot for St. Augustine and run five wells to get it. That, that's got to stop. The development side of this has got to have an honest question. We can't just keep letting development happen. I heard the last panel was in that conversation. So we we got to do better on those on those levels. We've got to have some conversations, and the longer we defer it, the less water we have in the future. So, Representative King, we've heard a bit about the the turnover at the legislature and losing a lot of institutional knowledge. You, being someone who's walked the halls for more than 20 years, how do we how do we get the legislators to really understand and care about these issues? Well, and, um, and of course, we, we never know what committee we're going to serve on in the next, none of us do, in the next session of the legislature. It's up to the board, the lieutenant governor, and the speaker where we get to serve. We only make the request and, and hope that they, they, um, they honor those and to the best of their ability that they can. But So I think that, um, and of course, the drought, candidly, as harsh as it is, helps us bring attention to it. And I think that so many 
of our cities and communities, no regardless of how large they are, even in Austin, where Senator Eckhart is, have huge infrastructure needs. And when I speak of infrastructure, you know, some of the communities I represent are talking about secondary water sources and being infrastructure. When I speak of infrastructure, I'm talking about the pipes in the ground and the water processing plants that are there that are losing half their water as we speak. And so um, I think that we need to make a huge focus. We have a year to do it. And of course, we've got you know a $27 billion um, surplus with you know five times that many requests. But I think that we have a good time to make a serious concerted effort to try and assist communities, uh, particularly rural communities that simply can't make the kind of matches that the Water Development Board and that the, the voters have required us to make. And so I think by focusing on the improvements for the infrastructure, reemphasizing that the drought is here and uh, that we will be able to get a lot of folks in there. I know there's some efforts to create a water caucus and things like that that will also help educate people, and, and I'm hoping that those will. But there's no question that we need to recruit people to the Natural Resources Committee. It's historically one of the most requested committees in the Texas House of Representatives, sometimes the most requested. And so um, we hope that that's the case again, and I think it will be. Thank you. Senator Eckhart, would you like to share any thoughts on, on the drought and kind of harnessing that in the upcoming session? Sure. I've heard droughts described as a slow-moving natural disaster. Um, and we are seeing episodic peaks in our drought, but I don't think that it will come as a shocker to anybody in this room that given the fact that our water plan is 2.2 to 2.5 thousand, uh, let's see, with 2.2 to 2.5 million acre feet short currently, and that our groundwater will be reduced by about 30 percent, our overall groundwater capacity will be reduced by about 30 percent by 2070, that uh, uh, laying aside our episodic 50 days straight of triple degree heat, we are in an ongoing drought. And so we need to treat this as the emergency circumstance that it is and not lose attention when it starts to rain. So our job as public servants are to keep the eye on the ball so that we can be effective, efficient, fair, and minimally intrusive and run like your dishwasher, quiet in the kitchen, you get up in the morning and your dishes are clean. Yeah, it's not a sexy issue, but we as public servants at the state level need to solve the issue uh, and not lose our attention just because it started raining. So I'm new here, I'm new in the Senate, uh, I think probably I was put on um, water, agriculture, and rural affairs because they thought it was hilarious to put the state senator from the city of Austin there. Uh, <laughs> but actually, this is an area of deep interest for me for the last 20 years. And as a land use attorney uh, and as a commissioner and a county judge, um, in a central Texas region that is transferring water across county lines and is in protracted warfare over it. Um, I am looking forward to a day where the state steps in um, aggressively and effectively and efficiently um, for the distribution of a resource that's actually contracting over time at the same time as our population is increasing. Thank you for that. Okay, the, I think perhaps the dishwasher analogy should be part of, you know, like the speaker and the lieutenant governor's pep talk when you open session. All right, guys, let's operate like a dishwasher. <laughs> so um, I want to move on and talk about sunset. Um, during the legislative update that our audience heard earlier, they got a bit of a, a overview of what that process is. So I'm not going to go into it here, but uh, representative uh, excuse me, Senator Perry serves on the Sunset Commission and we've got both the Texas Water Development Board and the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality uh, going through that process. The Development Board has had their initial hearing and recommendations have been made. TCEQ has had their initial hearing, but the hearing where recommendations are gonna be made, it comes in October. Uh, I was hoping that you could talk about um, the TWDB recommendations and then what you see potentially coming for TCEQ and in particular how that might touch groundwater. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so first time on Sunset, I don't know what I did wrong. 
Um, and I didn't know why you were on my committee, but now I know. But I, you know, there, it all makes sense now. But, but uh, in truth, and, and, and I think you have a little element of truth in that maybe, but you have been a great asset because I live in an area where urban issues are not quite as prevalent, so it's good to have that. It's why the process works. Sunset, uh, being in Sunset, so Texas Water Development Board came through pretty clear, pretty clean. They do a great group, a uh, great organization. I had made a recommendation that uh, Senate Bill 1511, I spoke to earlier about a water plan needs to be real, needs to be realistic and actually feasible to happening. It had not been implemented since 2020. We had a hearing that it was supposed to be. Now there was some disagreement of when that could occur or not occur, so I made it clear through uh, sunset that Senate Bill 1511 has to be part of anything going forward and actually retroactive uh, to, to go back through that water plan process and it was intended to be that way. So I just cleared that concept up. As far as just how they operate in things, uh, they came through really well. Uh, I would say them and every agency the state of Texas has and as legislature we'll be having this conversation routinely and regularly through finance hearings I've had, the wage pressures, right? We're losing quality people every day to private sector and other folks that can pay three times what they're making. And so we're losing historical knowledges in these agencies that is critical to have on board. So we have to find a way at the state level to incentivize, it can't always be a paycheck, to give people the, 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 the desire to continue to work in those fields. So Water Development Board uh, had, had some good stuff come through from TCEQ was under some really hard uh, scrutiny, I think, on some level. Uh, some of it uh, probably self-imposed or, or lack of transparency. So most of the recommendations on uh, TCEQ was that public needs to be more involved, there needs to be more of a transparent permitting process, there needs to be a lot of things. But here's what I noticed about Sunset in that. And Sunset should never be a regulatory body in the sense that, or, or, or a legislative body. Uh, I had to remind Sunset with the TCEQ uh, stuff that they were upset or recommending on, those were policy decisions. So we pulled back almost all of the TCQ sunset recommendations or, or concerns as more of a overreach and scope of what sunset was supposed to do. So we pulled those out. Several of them will be revisited, I think, through the legislative cycle. They probably do need to be looked at. I am tweaking a statute that has an inconsistency in it that created some problems for TCQ. Specifically, the one that I think applies to y'all and y'all's world and my world as water chairman was they were going in and going to effectively clear any uh, outstanding uh, surface water permit that had not been used, I think, for 10 years. Uh, way overreach. That's not a sunset job. That's not where that bleeds. That's a policy decision. Those surface water permits, whether I've used them or not, are granted to me in the dark ages, maybe. Maybe I inherited them from a granddad to a dad to whoever. But that is not a sunset recommendation. That is way outside their scope and boundaries. That is absolutely affecting water policy at a deep level when you start having permits just wiped off the books because of non-use. I'm not suggesting to you that a conversation with those permit holders shouldn't ensue, but there's probably value there. There's probably compensation due. And they estimated an 8 million acre feet recap from that, and they clearly don't understand how surface water permitting goes and the appropriated water thereof. So they were way outside their box on that. So I think Water Development Board came through well, and it's a great agency. And both, to, to get you, I have a lot of respect for my agencies in general. I don't know across the board of agencies that don't do a good job and have hardworking people doing a lot for very little when it compared to their counterparts in the private sector. There are always those anecdotal one-offs that we deal with as legislatures, constituent calls but our agencies have a lot of people. PUC was another one. It was kind of a water session. There are elements of PUC that's coming through uh, the sunset process that I'll be involved in too. So that's Sunset 101, I think. Yeah, thank you for that. So Chairman King, you've been through the sunset process over seen agencies go through it. Just curious if you'd like to comment on the process or what you see coming for those agencies as those those legislative bills make their way through? Well, I, it's an appropriate question because it's no secret among my colleagues that I have concerns about the process at sunset. And so I am uh, so grateful. We're kindred souls here more than I knew, Senator. Um, and um, I actually filed an amendment to the sunset bill one time or to a bill that was going to strictly limit the function of sunset to pass or fail type things for agencies. 
and um, and I got some attention on the floor, and it was my intention, and then it occurred to me that I was probably, you know, using the sunset process to make a policy or something, you know, and, uh, but I, um, I, I, I'm, I had no doubt that Water Development Board would come through this thing unscathed, and uh, TCEQ is, by the very nature of what they do, is controversial with the public, and so you're going to get a lot of public outcry about that, and, and it, you know, we constantly have to remind people that TCEQ is a permitting agency. It's not a decision, they don't, you know, they don't decide whether that landfill should be there or that thing should be there. It's, it's, or if it's, you know, good for the community, it's a permitting agency. And if people meet the requirements and it's environmentally appropriate, well, then they'll get a permit. Unless, you know, people always ask me, so, well, how do we stop that landfill or whatever? And I said, well, you bankrupt them. I mean, that's what you can do. But the ones today are big enough where they, they know what they're in for. But, but, so I am a big believer in that the sunset process and I have a great deal of respect for the men and women that serve on it. They put in countless hours on that pro, on that committee, and um, but that it it is used as a tool for policy making far more often than it should be, in my personal opinion. You know, if you got a problem with the way that um, something is handled, this TCEQ, these water rights that he was talking about, or a classic case, well then file a piece of legislation and work it through the committee and all that kind of stuff. But don't make a the life of an agency depend on whether or not a piece of legislation passes that may have some very controversial policy changes in it. You're just using that as leverage. And I understand that sometimes, particularly for legislators that um, haven't managed to acquire a lot of leverage, that that's their only opportunity sometimes. But that's not the way it should be done. I mean, we have a committee, you have the Senate committee and our committee that can look at that and decide whether it's good public policy, separate and apart from the sunset process, in my view. So thank you for standing up for that, Senator. Thank you for that. So maybe kind of t still talking about our water agencies, but zooming out a little bit, focusing less on sunset. Senator Eckhart, I'd be curious to hear kind of your perspectives on the roles of those agencies and what you know resources or tools you may think they could use to do their jobs better, to do more. Sure. In my, in, my private, uh, in, in my prior life as a lawyer and as a commissioner and as a county judge, I, um, I had um, SOA hearings with TCEQ. Um, I raced developers to TCEQ to keep them from being able to pay a small fine for their pollution rather than face the music and litigation for their pollution from the county as the plaintiff. Um, I worked with the Water Development Board to try and find resources for tiny communities that did not have the, the tax base necessary to solve their problems in their groundwater conservation district or with their CCN uh, or their municipal utility district that had gone under. So from my life before hitting the Senate, I have worked with the Water Development Board and TCEQ, and sometimes against TCEQ for their failure to regulate. Um, so I see that we need to have a much higher degree of coordination between the Water Development Board, the TCEQ, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, I very much appreciate your bill, uh, um, uh, to allow Texas Parks and Wildlife to uh, participate in contested hearings at TCEQ. I hope you refile that one. Um, be because we do need to... Uh, <laughs> and we were doing so well. We know who speaks next. <laughs> Um, we, we really do need to use our regulatory framework in a way that, that, um, that will build trust with Texans. We can't fail on this regulatory mission. Um, failure is really life and death. So we've got to figure out a Texas version of regulating what we frankly mythologize as a private property right. It is absolutely a human right to have water. Uh, but treating it as a private property right and, and watching TCEQ dance around afraid to regulate uh, is, is going to cost us, and not just in money. Thank you for that. So I think 
just, just real Perry quick, just I, to add on. back to TCQ, their biggest challenge through the sunset was based on a lack of education in the local community. So we had a big brouhaha, if you will, from constituents in one of the largest counties in Texas, if not the largest, over noise and traffic and air quality. First of all, n noise and traffic is text dot. Secondly, that permit that allowed the concrete plant that came into that community was a local permit. So when you have unincorporated counties such as Harris, and you have all these regulations and rules that have no continuity of interest between the people. So they were getting, TCEQ was getting the brunt of, you're not regulating these concrete plants or whatever, sand plants back in the day. And that's a local ordinance that allowed those permits to exist. So TCEQ has a, a little bit of education, I think, to do that. Here's where we stop and start. We're doing one of the recommendations, recommendations is a portal on every permit to allow people to interact, where TC can say, that's us, or that's your county, or that's us, or that's your city, to keep them out of some of this stuff that's going on so that. On the other thing, just in general, I, I, Chairman King and I have committed to a meeting. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I'm very cognizant of the fact of the power of a big checkbook. And there's no bigger checkbook in Texas with a 300 billion growing north of that budget coming up. So when you turn agencies into a advocacy at a contested hearing case, knowing that they have the full faith in government of Texas behind it, that becomes a different conversation for the average Texas landholder, whatever right it may be at the question or issue. Um, that's why SOA is a, is a problem for me on a lot of levels, and I continually file legislation to try to make that process more neutral rather than advocacy for the state position on stuff. So all that to say is we need to be really careful when we put agencies in those positions of legal battles because they do have the biggest checkbook in them and that doesn't necessarily mean that's the best outcome for the citizen. Thank you for that. Representative Cassell, would you like to comment at all on the development board and TCQ as we wrap up this topic? You know, my experience with the two or a sunset process is it's transparent and brings things to light. But the Texas Water Development Board as a bank and as the permitting side of TCEQ at my former district and, you know, looking forward to my new district, you know, we've worked well together on the permitting side and the Texas Water Development Board has just always been an asset. Obviously, they need another commissioner that I think will be visiting about soon and how those commissioners are located and found and who is uh, meets the requirements. I mean, I heard that conversation the last few days. Uh, the sunset process, I think Sledge, Brian Sledge hit on the nail as this comes to the floor. What amendments will we have to defend to keep that process pure and focused and make sure we do what's right? And once January 10th gets here, all bets are off. Thank you for that. So um, moving on now, I want to talk money. Um, it's already been alluded to. Uh, things are definitely looking good for the upcoming uh, legislative session in terms of dollars available. Um, the comptroller just raised the estimate of general revenue um, by almost $14 billion. I had to double check that. Yes, it was a B. Um, and there's also dollars coming in from the federal government through the investment in Infrastructure and Jobs Act. So definitely money is going to be a topic in, in how to spend it, how to allocate it. Senator Urquhart, why don't I start with you? Um, you know, this is viewed by a lot of folks as a unique opportunity to invest in water. Um, where do you... Where would you like to see that prioritized, um, whether it's infrastructure funding with those I, you know, IAJA funds or, or other dollars from the general revenue as well? It's definitely infrastructure funding. I mean, uh, uh, I think the, is it the American Academy of Civil Engineers, I think that's what it's called, gives us a C minus for drinking water and a D for wastewater in the state of Texas. So um, I think that infrastructure is really where it's at. We've really got to take a look at our water distribution mechanisms um, and start investing uh, at the state level. We are investing at the local level. Um, uh, and it is a heavy burden. Um, 
we, we definitely need a plan for water reserves throughout the entire state of Texas. And that's going to look different in different parts of the state, whether it's desal, whether it's aquifer storage, uh, um, whether it is produced water, which I really commend Senator Perry for putting together. Um, there are going to be multiple different answers, and it's going to look very different across the state. But those investments need to start now. Thank you. Senator Perry, you're on Senate Finance. Uh, you're a CPA. You think about dollars a lot. Um, where do you see opportunities to invest um, infrastructure and also just in the groundwater space specifically? Well, I think, you know, Texas continues in the last three sessions the biggest budget of the history, and we keep adding to that. There's a lot of reasons for it, and I could go into them, but on the water initiatives, I'm asking for funding for the pilot project to... Uh, put in a couple of pilot projects on the Senate Bill 601 to produce water stuff uh, to determine the technology and the, and the cost recovery vehicle and what that may look like. I think we're going to have huge successes in that, and it's large volumes of water. It's 14 million barrels of water a day that we're talking about potentially could be recovered at some level. So I'm excited about that. So that'll be one of my asks. I'm going to pursue the idea of helping the leaky pipes and leveraging local small rural, mid-sized communities specifically. Um, I will look into, and it's been tried in other states and successful, at some point we've got to have this development question. Maybe we, we, we provide some type of initiative to where a developer doesn't come in with a premise that we're going to put in sod, but what if we were able to subsidize some zero scape process and start at least having that conversation in Texas and shut down some of these, um, what I call fun and, and, and my right to do, but really not smart from a conservation perspective going forward. So, so those are some things on the water side I'm going to ask for. I will tell you there's five constitutional caps or statutory and constitutional caps that keeps us from spending all the money. And that's a good thing because this, this hyperinflated economy that we've had for lots of juice from the Fed's money is going to slow down. So we get to keep that reserve for next session. So there's going to be a lot of those conversations. I will tell you, I have in my bailiwick alone, the grid initiative that I've kicked around is about a $9 billion price tag if we choose to go down that road. So you start adding up all these deals, that $27 billion don't last long, but we can't spend all of that 27. But we're north of $300 billion without adjusting for, or with adjusting for inflationary factors. So a lot of money, a lot of opportunity. I'm hearing infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. I think our job is to make sure infrastructure includes water and alternative sources to energy. There are some really good energy sources which tie to water development because if you have a cheaper source of energy to do desal, that takes about 30% of the cost of desal, kind of lowers that variable or that input. So it all ties together, but I do sense there's a, there's a, a desire to spend that money in permanent transformational legacy building techniques, so I'm excited about it. Thank you for that. Representative Cassell, where would you prioritize spending in the water space? I'm just glad we're all on the same page. Infrastructure, I mean, there's an opportunity to add more money to SWIFT to give that opportunity to those small communities. I mean, Representative Chairman King talked about leaky pipes and infrastructure in these small towns. The communities that I represent have 80 to 90 year old water infrastructure. And we've got to stop the loss. I mean, conservation, all these methods we talk, nothing should be left off the table as we move forward. I mean, we've got lots of opportunity. I was convinced you were going to start by saying aquifers are infrastructure. <laughs> I mean, we can't say, this is not the crowd for Instagram and Twitter for hashtag aquifers are infrastructure. But if it takes off from here, Vanessa, Vanessa well done. will do that for sure. For sure. Representative King. Well, I don't really have anything to add to what was done. It was It's actually been stated very, very well. Um, I am biased, so I want to, whatever funds we do have available, you know, I'd like to see them go to water infrastructure to a great extent. Um, you know, the highway department, since the way we've changed up the law, with the, the, they, they get pretty well funded. I mean, you can always use more, but they, they have a certain set funding structure that's really saved them in the last five or six years. But, and I do want to point out for anybody that, that doesn't think about it, we do. Uh, I've served on appropriations several times and, and bless those that choose to do so. Um, 
But, um, you know, we've got a big government in the state just to run the things that we do, and the inflation that affects each and every one of us in our household is also going to affect the state budget. And so a big chunk of that $27 billion or whatever it ends up being, unfortunately, is going to go just to pay for ongoing state services and try to keep our, our state employees working for us. I mean, there's already discussions, as uh, Senator Perry alluded to earlier, about the difficulty of maintaining employees, uh, particularly in an area like Austin, Texas. So, you know, $27 billion is not going to be $27 billion for these other needs, but we need to try to make sure that as much of it as we can, we want to put towards water infrastructure and those basic water needs, in my opinion. Thank you for that. So the last topic I wanted to talk about with y'all is uh, groundwater quality. Uh, there were some good conversations at the House Natural Resources interim hearing last week about that. Um, and the plugging of wells, for example, came up, the abandoned uh, water wells, as well as the reconditioned oil and gas wells. Representative Cassell, you serve in addition to on House Natural Resources on House Environmental Regulation, so I think you've been looking at these issues in, in both capacities. Um, you know, do you see this as an area where we may see some progress this upcoming session? Um, and, and how, if, you know, how would you like to see that happen? I hope so. We, we realize the severity of the issue with the unplugged wells. We know how many there are. There's some federal funding available to help, but that number, I mean, we don't even have an accurate number how many unplugged wells are out there. So the fact that we're moving forward, trying to identify those and get it, and what is the cost? I mean, in the hearing, we heard anywhere from 25,000 to it never ends. We had, had a gentleman that testified that he did one on his own and thought he was a genius. He used some uh, better adjectives than I can use here today. But he was, you know, one went well for 25000 The next one, I think he's still writing checks, trying to get it plugged. So, you know, each unplugged well will uh, act differently as we try to plug it with the techniques that we have. And we got to hope that technology gives us the ability to do this faster, easier, better, and more efficient and less of a burden on our on our, on our pocketbook. As Senator Perry points out very clear, that money has stop gaps. We can't use it all. It will be a difficult session, and those will be some of the toughest votes we make this session on where this money goes. And I think from your perspective, looking up here at four members of the legislature in both houses on both sides of the aisle, we are committed to making sure our 170 whatever colleagues are focused on water for the first time, even though we go into this fighting COVID, fighting ERCOT, fighting Roe v. Wade, all these other issues that are so important to so many, they don't mean anything if you go to your tap and you can't draw a glass of water to get through the morning. Thank you for that. Uh, Chairman King, you've worked on abandoned water well issues in the past. You mentioned bill that had made it almost over the finish line a few sessions back. You know, landowners, and this came up in the hearing as well, are often left, you know, they go into it unaware of really what they're getting into when it comes to possibly abandoned water wells on their property or maybe even accepting one of these uh, P13 wells. Uh, what solutions do you think might be out there? Um, how could we potentially go about addressing that situation? So you're talking about the unplugged wells again? Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of landowners, um, and, and I've, I've seen this firsthand, uh, you're walking around on your property and you trip over an unplugged well, um, you know, your first reaction is to do the right thing and think, well, you know, we need to take care of this. Who do I call? And then, and then your neighbor says, you might want to think about that for a minute because uh, that could cost you a bunch of money and it's going to be. So somehow we need to remove the fear of reporting, I think. And, uh, and the fear of reporting is just the fear of the money that you might be liable for or end up. And so I think that that's part of it is we need to educate people not to be afraid to report those. But to do that, it's going to cost us some money. I'm, I'm encouraged the Railroad Commission claims they're going to plug seven or 800 wells, of, seven or 8,000 wells a year now. They think they've got a program to do that on, the, on their end of it. And on the water wells, you know, we need a... Uh, we need to think of some kind of program that we can create for groundwater districts to have a little fund similar to what the Railroad Commission has to uh, plug abandoned wells and starting with deteriorated wells because those are the ones that are damaging the, the infrastructure, you know. The plugged wells that aren't deteriorated and unplugged wells that aren't deteriorated are one thing, but the ones that are deteriorated where you actually have water going from one strata to another, those are the ones that are dangerous. So I think we need to start thinking about maybe some way to 
for the groundwater districts to have some kind of little fund so that people aren't just terrified of reporting one. Senator Eckhart, your thoughts on that? Uh, we certainly have to address the unplugged well issue. We also have, um, Senator Perry mentioned um, concrete batch plants. A concrete batch plant polluted an entire community's water system on the border between Williamson County and Travis County. It took us years to unravel that uh, because nobody, there was no governmental entity that felt responsible for these people's well having been poisoned by a concrete batch plant. Um, TCEQ shut down their well because it was contaminated contaminated with benzene, and neither, neither county had the authority or the finances to address it. Um, there was no GCD covering it, um, and it required, uh, ultimately we got HUD money, uh, CDBG money, uh, to assist these folks. But it literally took years, and to see people, it was troubling. They were covered with lesions from using water that had been contaminated by benzene. Um, also, in creeks just east of Austin, um, we have some of the highest levels of fecal coliform because of failing septic. Because such a high percentage of our residential water use um, is reliant on wastewater disposal and septic that although counties are charged with regulating it, uh, most counties do not have the robustness um, necessary to actually have eyes on the ground. And much like the unplugged wells, folks want to do the right thing, but when their septic overtops, they don't call the government. Um, so we've got to figure out a way to make a, again, a regulatory regime that Texans will embrace as effective, efficient, and fair that they can trust is, going, is there to help them uh, and not to punish them, including our, our GCD um, uh, board members. Um, groundwater conservation districts, it's hard to get people to serve on them because they're terrified of what might happen to them. So if we can get out of the punitive head and get all around the table and build some trust um, so that we can manage our groundwater contamination sources in, in a, in a trustworthy and collaborative fashion. Uh, that's something I'd really like to work on with, with these men and with my other colleagues. Thank you for that. Senator Perry, groundwater quality. Say, <laughs> yeah, you know, well permitting or plugging. So, so a lot of it's these 60 vintage, 50, 60 year old kind of, or when they came into being. I remember a guy told me, yeah, we plugged it. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, oh, we threw a bag of concrete down around the casing in hopes it holds. Uh, so I think if, and, and I'm glad that the Railroad Commission's picked this banter up and seriously and honestly, and we, we funded that, right? You know what, we fund what gets done sometimes. So I think that that's a great initiative. I hope they're starting with the oldest wells first. Up in my water district, they really know pretty much where all the wells are as far as a water district goes. They, they're pretty good. Uh, secondly, along that lines, I found out through conversations with the people that would know and understand it, the bond requirement for an operator when they shut down and leave is so stinking low. It didn't even approximate the cost of plugging a well. If there's a problem, for sure. If there's not, it doesn't. So I'm uh, more than willing to, and I know if Texoga or people listening, I'm going to get a whole host of conversations started. But, uh, you know, it's the right thing to do that if you abandon a well or move off of a well site specifically, that that well is your responsibility. And, and however, the contracts and the mineral interest and all that stuff on the front end, that should be more of a prevalent piece of that. But they are responsible for cleaning up their own stuff. And the bond that requires them to do it won't even cover the, the, the first drive out by the, the, by the folks to do it. So I'm open to having a conversation about a bigger bonding requirement for after the fact to require those people to clean up their stuff because who else but them that's the best source that's the easiest that's the most efficient source we all agree it needs to be done who's the one that should do it and who are the best efficient way to do it it's the people that shut the well down and moved on and that's where i'm at thank you for that so we have covered a lot of topics i've so enjoyed this panel i do want to give you all an opportunity to tell us what of, of all of this or if it's something we didn't talk about 
What's your number one priority when it comes to water for the upcoming session? And why don't we just start here with you, Representative Cassell? Number one priority is to maintain the focus and help our colleagues understand it in the interim hearings. You know, the two things that I took away is that we have not defined, and, and Sledge touched on this earlier, is defining waste and, con and con conservation in the water code. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for us to fix it. Watching a movie the other night and watching two lawyers bicker with a judge, and, and she goes, this is the law. Take it up with your legislature. And it's our turn to take it up to make sure we're successful in our water policy and how Texas grows and provides water for the future. Chairman Perry? I'll continue to be the clinging symbol for water supply. Conservation is important. We absolutely need to find a way to encourage people to be better at that, but water supply, water supply, water supply. Um, and, and, and I think that the, that's consistent with me. I think the next thing, and, and I'll say it with, with no no disrespect or anything about the conversation are ongoing. Um, we are a private property state. Our cornerstone of who we are and how we exist is a private property owner. That is one of the very things that we were established as a nation on. The pursuit of happiness was a synonymous with the right to own property, basically. We still believe you have opportunity to have, develop, and, 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 and wealth. And, and as an individual and we are one of the few and I understand all the nuances and the complications that creates but whatever we do in this state cannot be at the expense of an industry or a person for the benefit of another sector or a person part in this state and as long as I'm around I will have all of those pieces in front of me so any regulation that goes down the road of diminishing that private landowners right to do what they deserve to do they pay for land that had it underneath there, and the value to that land is associated with it. It's going to happen. When I'm gone, for sure it's going to happen. But in the meantime, if it does, it's going to be a compensationable event. Chairman King? Well, I, uh, I think it's been stated already again. But um, So personally, I'm going to um, work on the trying to fund those small communities on the infrastructure like we've talked about because to me that's that's water supply that's water that's conservation all rolled up into one because you're creating water almost in in a sense and then um i uh, i want to work and look at some kind of i think it's probably early but i want to start talking about some type of fund like I said, for the groundwater districts, you know, maybe I don't know how we get there. I don't know how you do that. Something to help people plug those uh, water wells, the abandoned water wells. And um, and I agree with what Senator Perry said about the property rights issue because, um, I mean, we, we, we don't have, as it's been said many times, no matter what we believe reality is, we, we only can work with people's perception of reality. And so we have to work within the parameters that are given us today and not the parameters that we wish they were. And so, that, as policymakers, that's what we have to recognize whenever we're forming policy for the state of Texas, because it has to be something that the people in general will accept, because if they won't accept it, it's, it's, it's not worth the paper it's written on. So, anyway, that's what I want to work on. Thank you for that. Senator Eckhart, you want to take it home? I, I uh, agree with everything that's been said, particularly the idea that we have to deal with the, the perception um, uh, and uh, how we see ourselves as Texans and our relationship to water. We have to work within our narrative. Um, and working within our narrative, I recognize that it's, it's difficult, but to find a way for our narrative to embrace the fact that um, the atmosphere is sucking more moisture out of the earth <laughs> um, at a time where our population is increasing. So we will have to grapple with a, um, a distribution of this necessary resource that is different from how we've treated it in the past. So finding that sweet spot that feels right to us as Texans is um, is where I'm going to be focusing, and I will throw in one other possible hashtag. Not only are aquifers infrastructure, but they feed into the motherlode of all common carrier pipes, our rivers. 
So I am hoping we can also wrap our heads around a acknowledgement of the interplay between uh, surface water, which is a resource of the state, and groundwater, which we perceive as a private property right. Well, thank you all so very much. Really, it has been an honor to have you here. Um, this has been a great panel. I have loved this conversation. I think probably everyone in the room, it's, it's been really quiet and we've got standing room only in the back there. Um, and I also wanna thank you all for, for taking the time to be here, but most importantly for your service and dedication um, to the people of Texas. So thank you.